Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It is, man, it's so exciting to be here in Krakow. And um, I'm going to go today into how we built the Starlink app, which I think is a really interesting story. Um, but first, let me start with a quick intro on myself. Um, my name is Aaron. Uh, I'm a software engineer at SpaceX. Started my career in native iOS and Android development, um, but I've since focused on React Native. And I've done some cross-platform work at Microsoft. Most recently, before SpaceX, I was at Tesla working on the Tesla mobile app, um, which is also a really cool uh, example of React Native. And 3D, if you haven't checked it out, definitely recommend it. Um, but now I'm a software engineer at SpaceX, and I work on the Starlink user experience team. So uh, our team is four engineers, um, and we're responsible for the Starlink app, among a bunch of other projects at SpaceX. So we, we definitely keep busy. Uh, but the thing that I really love about SpaceX is that we have this principle of extreme ownership. We own our products end to end, which means we are responsible as individual developers on the product management and requirements gathering, on the design and UI uh, side of things, on the engineering, and on the, data, on the data analysis of, is this feature performing well? So a lot of these examples that I'm going to give in this talk, these are things that our entire team has owned and executed on an individual basis. If that sounds interesting to you, quick plug, we are hiring on our team. So reach out to me if you're interested in, in possibly joining us. Um, we'd love to chat with you. And even if you're not, follow me on X. We'd love to, to share more content there. All right, let's hop into it. So as a quick background before we jump into the Starlink app, SpaceX was founded with the goal of making life multiplanetary. On that mission, we're launching Falcon rockets, and we're using them. We're docking Dragon capsules to the International Space Station. We're developing Starship, which is going to be the first fully reusable rocket, and it's designed to establish a sustainable presence on Mars. Oh, and uh, we also put a Tesla into space once, which is kind of cool. Um, so we're pretty busy, but we, we also have this other project called Starlink. And Starlink is a space internet service provider. We provide high speed, low latency internet from space almost anywhere on the planet. Starlink originally uh, was created to help fund the development of Starship and get us to Mars. But in the, in the short term and in the here and now, we're connecting places on Earth that previously were never connected. We're providing access to education, healthcare, and economic opportunities to communities all around the world, which is really cool. We're currently available in 100 countries, and we have over 3 million users. We're active on airplanes and boats, used for emergency and humanitarian relief worldwide. We operate 6,000 satellites in low Earth orbit at around 550 kilometers. And this, different, this differs pretty significantly from traditional satellite internet. They'll place, their, they'll place their satellites typically at a 35,000 kilometer orbit. And that allows the, the satellite to have what appears on the ground like a stationary position in the sky. Our proximity helps us because we reduce latency, but it also requires sophisticated tracking because those satellites are moving super quickly overhead. Our user terminal on the ground, the consumer hardware that we provide, helps solve this problem by using a phased array antenna and no moving components to dynamically track the satellite overhead with a narrow beam. This ensures continuous connectivity despite high speed. While these beams are high bandwidth, uh, low latency connections, their signal is easily attenuated by obstacles like trees and buildings. So it's vital that users maintain a clear view of sky to prevent dropouts in service. We refer to the obstacles that interfere with the link and cause a drop in signal strength as obstructions. And as you can imagine, this is a big cause of user pain and one of the things that we solve on our team. Now, Starlink is designed to be quick and easy to set up and allowing users to get online and self-install in minutes. The Starlink app comes alongside that and serves as the primary interface for configuring local network, managing service, troubleshooting connectivity, and finding an install location without obstructions. So now to the Starlink app. One of the very first tools that we built using 3D in the app, out of necessity, was Skyscanner. With obstructions being such an important part of having a good experience with Starlink, 
We're using this tool to help users understand what they should expect at their chosen install location even before they purchase the hardware. For the user, the experience is, is really simple. You scan the entire sky with your device's camera, and, we, and then you wait while we generate a map. That map reports locations of expected obstructions, and we estimate how that will affect your service. Under the hood, Skyscanner leverages advanced image recognition and 3D visualizations to make the process of scanning and viewing the results more intuitive to the user. So how does it work? Well, when a user begins scanning the sky uh, using their device's camera, we indicate progress using points projected in a 3D sphere. This is actually a 3JS 3D view that's, that's being overlaid on the camera. Those points are evenly spaced, and the user scans across and picks them up. We're using ExpoGL and 3JS for the real-time rendering of the dots, along with that black area below, which is a field of view projection of what we would expect the hardware to see. We also use a custom native module that we wrote to expose attitude sensor data from the device's accelerometer and gyroscope to determine the relative device orientation and change the camera positioning in that 3D scene. As the user scans the sky, we continuously capture images with Expo Camera. OK, so this is how it works. We capture a set of images. We load a custom trained model with Expo Asset that we have on device. We feed the camera frames into the model with TensorFlow.js which is G Expo GL GPU accelerated, by the way, which is another super cool use of Expo GL. We get a matrix out that represents our predicted obstruction map. And then we convert that matrix into a data texture in 3JS, apply it to a sphere geometry, and mask it with the user terminal's field of view. We take this map when we place it on top of a model of the hardware and it gives a user an interactive obstruction map that's rendered in 3D. It's really cool. So the obstruction tool turned out to be a great project. But next, we asked ourselves, after a user sets up, how can we make the app better at indicating your network status? How can we make an app that immediately gives you an intuitive look at your network highlighting the industrial design of your hardware and creates a more engaging UI. It's kind of a, kind of a bit of a challenge. Um, for a long time, we have relied on cryptic flashing of colored lights on the front of our routers to figure out what's wrong on our network. We think we can do better than this. Ultimately, this is so cool. We decided to build our app around a 3D scene completely that's a rendering of the user's current network topology in their Starlink setup. This approach has a variety of really, really compelling benefits for users. First of all, we talk a lot about building user intuition at Starlink. We want users to have a strong mental model for how their hardware is operating together. So we transition the 3D scene seamlessly as you navigate between screens. This not only gives the app a sense of cohesion, but it also gives a sense of place in the overall network topology, the physical topology. We wanted to continue to highlight our hardware design while scaling to different hardware combinations. 3D helps us make the app more scalable. Whereas we were bundling huge image assets um, for every different version of hardware we had before, we can now load models, which are in the tens of kilobytes, and have a negligible impact on app size. If we add a new piece of hardware to our lineup, we just pop in a model. We can also mix and match these models. Because we ship both a Starlink user terminal and a router in the kit, if someone swaps that router out with a different one or a newer generation, that will just be reflected in the app, no new assets needed. We can also tweak lighting and animations and camera orientation on the fly without having to generate new assets or load them into the app. Finally, we can represent basically a limited, uh, unlimited number of device states. For our actuated dishes that actually have a motor, this also includes actuation and rotation state. So here's some concrete examples of some states that we show. 
We can color the beam from the Starlink user terminal to the satellite based on how many obstructions you have. We can color the wire that's going between hardware to indicate signal strength or connectivity. And we can show the actuation, the real tilt of an actuated device reflected in the app in real time. Um, and finally, I think another reason to use 3D is it's just cool, right? I mean, internet, space is internet from space is futuristic, and so should the app, right? The more engaging we can make our app, the more users are going to come back to it, find issues on their network, device signal strength, new obstructions, or cable problems. One cool thing that we did for April Fool's Day this year was we added Mars mode as an Easter egg. This literally took us five minutes in the app after the model was generated. We just plopped it in our 3D scene, added a little toggle, and it was done. Super cool. Um, so we can build a production app centered around 3D in React Native. We've, we've kind of proved that out. Hopefully, this is causing you to think about, hey, are there ways that I can incorporate 3D, 3D into my app, even in micro interactions? Um, I wanted to hop through a few of our implementation details in case any of them are helpful to you. One of the key enablers um, of our entire app, really, is ExpoGL. And it's an awesome library from the Expo team. ExpoGL acts as a bridge between WebGL and OpenGL, allowing us to use WebGL code and run that natively in our app. This is what this cube looks like in WebGL. Um, yeah, that's a lot of code. So we're probably not going to be able to scale that to build all of this 3D work out. Luckily for us, there's a library called 3JS, which is a general purpose 3D library. And our code gets a lot simpler. This abstracts a lot of the complexity from, for us. But unfortunately, it's an imperative API. And we use React hooks and state. And it's hard to plumb this to a 3JS scene. Enter React 3 Fiber. React 3 Fiber allows us to work with 3JS using a declarative API. And this handles some really nice things for us, too, like disposing of a resource when a component is unmounted, state management built in, and asset caching. We've also found the ability to integrate with existing React hooks and state management in our app really useful. Basically, these 3D components work just like normal React components for us. So now that we have a 3D canvas set up with React 3 Fiber, we can use 3D to seamlessly transition between the states as we navigate from screen to screen. We'll accomplish this by having a single 3D canvas instead of multiple canvases for every screen. And we'll share that across our app. In app TSX, we'll put this view at the root of our app behind our navigator. We'll make sure that our navigation container is transparent so that we can see through it to the scene below. Now, all of the screens presented on top of this will, be, will show the 3D view. We also created a wrapper component that we can reuse for any screen that shows the 3D view behind it. The wrapper component are, is going to deal with the following things for us. Since the screen content inside the scroll view needs to be offset to show the 3D scene underneath, it'll, move, it'll space the content down. And when a user scrolls the content, we also need to dim the 3D scene behind it. So it will handle that with a scroll gesture handler. Finally, we include a touch surface. Because this screen is on top of everything else and the 3D view is in the back of the app, we need a way of plumbing our touch events through to the 3D scene. All of this combined, now we have a 3D view behind our scene content. And when we navigate to a new screen, boom, it works. The 3D content's still visible. Next, let's look at handling camera animation as we navigate from scene to scene. To accomplish this, we're going to need orbit controls. Not, not that kind of orbit control. Um, but it's probably worth mentioning that the Dragon team does a great job building their uh, UI. And they actually integrate 3D, too, which is, I think, really cool. And they should probably be giving a talk instead of me, or maybe next year. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm talking about a different kind of orbit control. Uh, 
in, in the 3D world, in game engine world, orbit controls refer to a set of tools that allow for the manipulation of a camera or, uh, to orbit around a target. It gives you tools like rotation, zooming, pan, etc. Um, most orbit controls incorporate event listeners to also handle user input so that you can move the camera around with input. Um, 3JS and React 3 Fiber both provide orbit controls, but their orbit controls only support DOM events. So we need an implementation that works with native touch events. Oh my gosh, Evan is everywhere. Um, I think there is not a library that Evan hasn't built, uh, but yes, Evan, this is great. Thank you so much. Um, this will solve our problem. Evan did the hard work of porting web event handlers to React Native gesture handlers. So we'll pull this library in. It works nicely with Vidal.js. And even though it's not documented with a small change, we can actually make it work with React 3 Fiber also. Now looking back on the completed app, notice every time the, the screen transitions, both the camera position in 3D space and the target that the camera is aimed at change. To enhance our orbit controls, we're going to add properties for the base camera position and target. Once we have these set, our camera will actively interpolate to these values until it gets to them, resulting in a smooth camera transition every time we change these values. And finally, we need to make sure touch events are correctly propagated to our orbit controls and our React 3 Fiber Canvas. We can accomplish this by doing a little bit of refactoring. We've developed a scene component in our app as a template for creating new 3D views in our app. It's a good example to illustrate how we can integrate various elements effectively. What we've done here is we've abstracted the orbit controls from the orbit controls component so that we have a reference and we've created a memoized pan responder and connected those up. We can pass our responder handlers to the touch service we created in our wrapper. Now, these touch events are effectively propagated to both the orbit controls and the React 3 Fiber canvas so that you can interact with the objects on your screen. Here's the result. It's pretty cool. You can move around with your finger, pinch and zoom, but you can also touch the elements. And these are separate components that are all working together. Bringing this to our app, we can use this new base camera position and target. And any time a screen is focused, the animation should seamlessly transition from the previous state. And that's what that looks like. So React Fiber isn't without some challenges. And I just wanted to address those two. The iOS simulator doesn't support hardware OpenGL acceleration, which means you can't do development of 3D in the simulator. We don't actually use the iOS simulator hardly at all because of that fact. Um, JS, uh, our JS implementation is also restricted to one thread. We can't use reanimated with 3JS. It's not supported. So we sometimes can see stutters in animations if the, the thread is locked up. 3JS also really doesn't have a native focus, neither 3JS vanilla or, 3, or React 3 Fiber. And so support is minimal. There's tons of features that don't work correctly. You can't take everything out of the box. And we had to re-implement the entire model loading mechanism to make it performant on low-level Android devices. Also, we're not done yet. There's so much more to dig into with this 3D uh, experience. And I'm excited about the new opportunities. I, there's a new library that's coming out soon that I've heard through the grapevine about that we're excited to try out. So there you have it, an app designed around 3D in production with millions of users. I hope that you walk away from this talk inspired to maybe take a stab at bringing 3D to your app or rethinking some of the UI, and maybe 3D is the best option. But also, I hope that you have the confidence to know that really with the combination of React Native and Expo, the sky's the limit. Thank you. <laughs>